Hi, welcome, and thank you for coming to Team Space's uh, thesis proposal pr uh, presentation. My name is Christina Natov. Presenting with you today, we have John Kalman and Harrison Bartlett. Also here from our team, we have Joe Bowser, Lawrence Galloy, Sarah Garner, Amber Sosis, and hopefully Carlos. Um, <laughs> Today we're going to talk about current spacesuit design, as well as the problems those designs present. Then we're going to discuss our research question and potential er, proposed methodology, as well as discuss our limitations and an overview of our subteam division, budget, and timeline. Now I'd like to pass it to John to discuss the basics of spacesuit design. So spacewalks, otherwise known as extravehicular activities (EVAs), are very beneficial to the scientific community. For example, the Apollo missions allowed for us to collect an extensive sample of moon rock that allowed for scientific study. Additionally, Spacewalk allows for us to repair the Hubble Space Telescope as well as conduct maintenance on the International Space Station. However, due to, uh, due to the current spacesuits, they, the ability of the astronaut is severely curtailed, which therefore lowers the produ productivity and efficiency. And our goal as a team is to be able to increase the productivity of EVA by increasing spacesuit mobility. So just a general overview of the anatomy of the spacesuit. Every spacesuit, regardless of the type, needs to have a number of functions in order to sustain life while in spacewalk, beginning with pressure retention. Uh, the air we breathe now and the atmosphere that we live in on Earth needs to be replicated in the vacuum of space inside the spacesuit in order for the astronaut to be able to sustain life while in EVA. Part of this comes to oxygen pressure, pressure regula regulation. In the air we breathe, oxygen is at a partial pressure of roughly 0.21 atmosphere, and this needs to be maintained inside the spacesuit. Additionally, when we breathe in the oxygen, carbon dioxide is breathed out, and this needs to be removed from the suit and replenished with oxygen to continue breathing. Also, the spacesuit regulates the astronaut's temperature by cooling the body and removing any heat caused both from solar radiation as well as the astronaut's metabolism. And lastly, the suit must be able to protect from ultraviolet rays from the sun that can potentially harm the astronaut later on in life. Now, there are two main types of space suits, soft suits and hard suits, and the suit that is currently used on EVA is the soft suit, otherwise known as the extravehicular mobility unit, or the EMU for short. Now, as shown on this diagram, there are a number of layers for the EMU suit. However, the three main layers of the suit are the pressure garment bladder, the restraint layer, and the thermal micrometeorite garment. The pressure garment bladder is a polyurethane coated nylon that holds all the air in the spacesuit. The restraint layer bears all the pressure and loads generated during movement, as well as keeps the pressure bladder in place and makes sure that all the pressure is evenly distributed throughout the suit. Lastly, the thermal micrometeorite garment both protects against solar radiation and protects against high velocity microparticles that could potentially harm the astronaut and inner components of the suit. The other type of suit we have is the Ames Experimental Suit 5, also known as the AX5, and this is a hard space suit made of completely rigid metal joints. Uh, the sealed rotary bearings allow for us to reduce the instances of EVA in injury. Because there is no pressure bladder in the suit and it remains at a constant volume, there is no need for restraint cables and therefore reduces the energy demand from the astronaut that could potentially cause damage due to strain. Additionally, the sealed rotary bearings and wedge elements allow for modular changes to the suit that can potentially change parts out if parts are damaged or if the suit needs to be resized to fit other astronauts. However, due to this incredibly high stowage volume and weight, the suit has never actually been utilized on an EVA mission. Now, the most important part of the AX5 comes down to the joint design. As shown on this diagram, the joints are three spherical wedges that are designed to rotate around each other, with the two outer wedges rotating in the same direction, while the inner wedge rotates in the opposite direction. Now, the orientation of each joint comes down to how the wedges are oriented. When the shorter edges are all lined up with each other, this constitutes a 120 degree bent motion, which bends the joint. While they're in the orientation shown on the screen, short, long, short, this is a fully straight arm, and this allows for the arm and any other joint to be changed into a variety of different motions. Now, there are a number of problems and risks that come along with both suits. Beginning with the EMU, there's severely reduced mobility. Because, of the, because the suit is pressurized, the suit is constantly fighting to return to its neutral position, and restraint cables help to fight this. However, they also curtail mobility at the same time by making gripping more difficult. While the AX5 is both large and heavy, it does remain at constant volume, and there is no pressure bladder, which allows for the suit to move into a position and then remain there. Next, because as well, while the suit fights to return to its position, the astronaut fights to keep it in the position it is at, which increases the metabolic cost, and increased metabolic cost can also increase the risk of injury due to exert extra exertion. 
Additionally, ent simply entering the EMU can actually harm an astronaut because if the astronaut enters the suit at the wrong orientation, it can actually break the astronaut's shoulders. Lastly, it takes a very specialized skill set to produce an EMU. Very advanced artisans with advanced sewing techniques have to sew together each piece of the EMU individually. And while it is inefficient to produce the AX5, it's much simpler. Uh, one must take a large block of metal and then mill the metal down to make it into each individual piece for the suit. However, this does increase the weight and the stowage volume of the suit. Now Harrison is going to talk about our rationale and our methodology behind our design. <laughs> Relinquish control. <laughs> so given this research, we've made the decision to move forward with a hard suit design for our prototype. And the biggest reason for that is that in the current EMU suit, 75% of the energy an astronaut spends on EVA is not actually spent accomplishing the tasks of the EVA at all. It's just physically bending the suit into the position that the astronaut needs to be in to be able to work. And this creates significant more energy expenditure, which leads to a higher potential of overuse injuries, which obviously can be very dangerous when an astronaut can't simply return to Earth for medical care. A rigid element spacesuit, on the other hand, uses low friction bearings and a constant volume on the inside, which means that it has no neutral position that it wants to return to like the EMU. So once the astronaut gets the suit in the position that he needs, it'll stay there until he moves it to a different position. So all of this leads us to our research question, which is, can rigid spacesuit joints, coupled with additive manufacturing, robotic and exoskeletal assistance, and other technologies, reduce the physical demands made on astronauts during spacesuits? And our hypothesis, we have two, is that first, yes, rigid element spacesuits will reduce the physical demands on astronauts in EVA, and second, that by using additive manufacturing technologies such as 3D printing, our suit will be compatible with long-duration missions because it will increase the potential for in-situ fabrication. <coughs> in order to evaluate these hypotheses, we will be doing four types of testing, materials testing, bearing testing, joint testing, and human testing. For materials testing, we'll be taking samples of 3D printed material and evaluating them to make sure that they will bear the loads of the suit. One of those tests was the hydrostatic test, which we have a cylinder out there, um, where we basically pressurize that to make sure that our suit would be able to withstand its operating pressure of 25 PSI, and that's with a safety factor built in. Um, for the bearing test, we'll be fabricating 3D printed bearings and comparing them to bearings made by a company called Kadon, which are like the state-of-the-art bearings for spacesuits today. And when they perform to satisfaction, we will then be integrating them into the wedge elements, as you see, and putting our full prototype on a test rig to measure the range of motion and the torque required to move the joint. And finally, after completing all of these tests, we'll be doing a human participant trial, where, where participants will perform a fits tapping test in a short sleeve environment wearing our prototype and wearing an actual EMU arm, and then we'll complete comfort surveys on the two spacesuits so that we can get a full picture of the mobility and comfort of our suit. We'll be doing these tests three times for our three different design iterations. We're on the first iteration right now, which is our Mark I design. That's being made as a part of the NASA XHAB competition, which is an undergraduate design competition for technologies related to long-duration human missions. So, at the end of this year, we're hoping to have this design finalized and go through our testing, at which point we will analyze the test results and make any necessary changes, which will then be the Mark II model. Uh, we will then run that through the same testing process that I described to ensure that our changes were successful. And at that point, we will be integrating an exoskeleton onto the suit to help provide active assistance to the astronaut, which will be our final Mark III prototype. We see several potential limitations in this plan. They are printing delays, printing costs, seal fabrication, and our timeline itself. The printers at the university all have backlogs. We have to wait to be able to get access to them. And if we go outside the university, it can become exp very expensive very quickly, especially with high quality space grade materials. As far as seal fabrication, traditionally bearing seals require very, low to or very high tolerances and very smooth surfaces to operate correctly. And we don't know that we will be able to replicate that with a 3D printed material. So that's a significant engineering challenge that we're currently in the process of addressing. And finally, our timeline is very tight with these three iterations. And so were anything to go wrong in those other limitations, it would be very difficult for us to stay on schedule. However, we think it's important to note that 
Even if all we accomplish is a successful Mark I iteration, we will still be making a significant contribution to the field and our research can still be a success. I'll now turn it over to Christina who will talk about our team organization. All right. In order to solve our problem and our research questions, we've decided to divide into four standard subteams. These teams were formed based on team members' uh, skills and experience levels in the four topics you can see on the top. Each team member is on two of these subteams, so there's a lot of overlap. Um, but at the same time, there's still problems that come up that don't really fit into the, the scope of these standard subteams. So when that happens, we form dynamic subteams that will balance out uh, different aspects of these standard subteams um, to work towards the problem, and then once we address that, they sort of dissolve. Uh, so the dynamic teams we've formed so far have been wedge element design, seal design, and IRV approval. Here we have a high-level overview of our timeline for our research. So far, we've began the NASA XHAB challenge, and this semester we've been working on completing our IRB approval and working on our uh, first iteration of our design. Next semester, we plan to accept, uh, uh, assess the success of our first design and begin incorporating changes uh, where we see fit. We will also begin preparing for junior colloquia. Then in the spring of 2018, we'll finalize our second design iteration, perform tests as Harrison mentioned, and begin incorporating power-assisted elements into our design. Then, fall of 2018, we'll finalize our third design, te perform testing, and begin data analysis. Spring 2019, we'll finish any data analysis remaining and prepare and present our thesis. Here we have our budget. We've budgeted just under $26,000, which seems like a huge number, but the majority of that uh, is being spent this first year, and it's funded by NASA's grant. Um, as Harrison mentioned, space grade materials can be very expensive, as can, be, as can outsourcing, so that's where the majority of our costs are coming from. Moving forward, we plan to make only minor changes, so the costs will drop dramatically. Uh, we plan to fund the rest of our endeavor through grants and our uh, launch OMD campaign. We'd like to thank our mentor, Dr. Aiken, our librarian, Ms. Sorkel, um, the Gemstone staff, Dr. Cole, uh, Dr. Scandal, and Ms. Tobin, as well as our guest experts here with us today, Dr. Becknell and Mr. Carpenter. We'd now like to open it up for questions.